If you can get people to believe the claim that raising wages always kills jobs. Taxes too high, wages too high. We're not going to be able to compete against the world. Then you have explained the economy to them in a way that makes them fear raising wages. If you raise the minimum wage, you're going to make people more expensive than a machine. And that means all this automation that's replacing jobs and people right now is only going to be accelerated. There are some people, I think, who, who just have difficulty not fitting the world into a particular structure. But we cannot do this if we are going to compete with the rest of the world. We just can't do it. So do not raise the minimum. I would not raise the minimum. From the offices of Civic Ventures in downtown Seattle, this is Pitchfork Economics with Nick Hanauer, where we explore everything you wished you'd learn in Econ 101. I'm Nick Hanauer, founder of Civic Ventures. I'm Stephanie Irvin. I run a lot of our advocacy and campaign work here at Civic Ventures. In our last episode, we've been focusing on the three legs of the trickle-down stool, and today we're going to cover that last leg. This one we're experts in, so get ready to answer the question, do higher wages kill jobs? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. And for sure, because wages are where the money is, this is the most pernicious claim of trickle-down economics. If you can get people to believe the claim that raising wages always kills jobs, then you have explained the economy to them in a way that makes them fear raising wages and be sympathetic to the idea that we shouldn't raise the minimum wage, that we shouldn't help workers, that uh, to do so would harm the very people it's intended to help. And this is the biggest lie in trickle-down economics. There's no empirical evidence for this, but it is really, really easy to understand why economic elites, why the Chamber of Commerce, why big business people are so hardcore about making this can't claim relentlessly. Because if they can get you to believe it, then you can be sure that their profits are going to be high and your wages are going to be low. Right. So this is one of the first fights I remember our shop being involved in. In the summer of 2013, yeah. I started hanging around the <laughs> Civic Ventures orbit. The fight in SeaTac was just getting underway. Yeah. So can That's you take us back to that time and how you got involved? Yeah. So we had for a long time been thinking hard about the issue of inequality and political economy and and my own work on sort of reimagining the dynamics of market economies and how they're really best understood as ecosystems, not this sort of mechanical zero-sum game when one thing goes up, another thing comes down. And so it was really clear that the question of the minimum wage wasn't, does raising it kill jobs, but rather, what's the optimal level for the minimum wage to generate growth for everyone? And we started nosing around for a good number. And what we realized was that if the minimum wage had tracked inflation since the 60s, it would have been about $11 an hour. If it had tracked productivity gains, it would be about $21 an hour. And if it had tracked the wages of the top 1% of earners, it would be about $28 an hour. And so we knew that a number like 15 was not as unreasonable as it then sounded, that in fact, if you took us back to the economy of the 60s, we were effectively paying 15 or $20 an hour relative to the economy back then. And so um, we started talking about 15 and modeling it in uh, mid-2012. Uh, fast food workers went on strike uh, mm -hmm. shortly thereafter in some places for 15. And our dear friends at SEIU, David Rolfe and Sterling Harders, cooked up this idea of running a $15 minimum wage campaign in the tiny town of SeaTac, where the airport is. Right. So Sterling actually talked about how airport, airport workers at SeaTac Sea Airport had been fighting for the better part of a decade um, to increase their wages. I think it's important to remember that all of those jobs at SeaTac Airport, lots of them, used to be good jobs, in many cases, good union jobs. Um, and in starting in the in to the year 2000 um, and 
and through the middle part of that decade, um, in particular, Alaska Airlines contracted out a lot of those jobs. And folks who had been making what was a decent living wage um, were suddenly uh, laid off and offered the um, opportunity to come back at their jobs, um, making oftentimes very close to minimum wage. So workers at the airport and around the airport had been trying to organize to make improvements for years. And they'd been fighting to improve their wages and they'd been fighting to form a union. And they finally said, uh, enough is enough. And they decided to take uh, their fight to the people of SeaTac, to the voters in SeaTac, and to let them decide whether or not workers at SeaTac Airport and around SeaTac Airport deserve to make a living wage. And so off we went. And of course, as you may remember, we took a lot of hits. People gave us a lot of shit about that. So I see it as a a job killer for the young and the immigrants in the country that are coming in that may not speak English perfectly. You don't want to get the best, uh, most efficient employee that you can for that kind of money. That's a middle wage, not the not the beginning wage. So you they thought we had shot. lost our minds politically, that it was mm-hmm. futile and stupid and hopeless that you could ever get something like that done. Uh, but they also thought, uh, including many, many of our friends on the left, e- even economist friends on the left, that by, by so doing, we would destroy Seattle's economy. We would crush jobs, that Seattle would slide into the Pacific Ocean and we'd all, you know, die because... Uh, such a thing would kill so many jobs. And of course, nothing remotely like that happened. In fact, the more we raised low wage workers' wages, the better the economy got. In fact, the data from last week suggests that the the fastest year o- over year uh, increase in employment in the entire country was in our area, plus 3.6%. Clearly, if raising wages killed jobs, we would not be in that position. Right. So in this episode, we'll talk to economists who have studied these real world examples, Mm -hmm. politicians who've had to live with the consequences of passing (laughs) minimum wage battles in their cities um, and get their take on whether the sky fell afterwards. Should be fun. (laughs) Should be fun. So our next guest is actually Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles. And, you know, we recorded this interview with Mayor Garcetti before he formalized his decision about not running for president. But we included the whole combo here because we hope it will help guide the thinking of many of our friends who are jumping into that race. And we fully expect to see more from him in national politics in the years to come. Mayor Garcetti, I am joined uh, by my colleague, Stephanie Irvin. Hi, Mayor. uh, We do this this thing called Pitchfork Economics. And we're super excited to talk to you. Uh, I'm in my overalls right now with a pitchfork. I love it. American Gothic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, perhaps the best exemplar of a fight over political economy and uh, a fight over the, the meaning of the economy and the fight over where prosperity comes from has resolved around the issue of the minimum wage. You were one of the early courageous actors on that issue. And did a $15 minimum wage in Los Angeles shortly after we did it. And uh, the prediction was that the city would slide into the Pacific Ocean and cats and dogs would live together and the whole thing would come tumbling down. Update us on what's happened. <laughs> well, well cats, cats and dogs are living together. So that part was uh, true. But we did not slip into the ocean. Um, and in fact, uh, we... You know, by the time we get to 15, it'll be about, uh, I think, a $3.4 million raise every single hour of work in the city for more than 500,000 families. Wow. Um, a majority, I think it's 550,000 Angelinos will see these continuing wages go up. It's 13.25 today. It'll be $15 in two years. And what that allows us to do is to see that money get recycled. Our unemployment, I think, went down by 14% the first year the wages went up. So everything that was predicted, and it's not to say there isn't some dislocation, some difficulties in right. other industries, but the net gain has been overwhelming. And we're seeing um, huge new startups for businesses, small businesses on our main streets. And we think more money being spent by everyday people because... If you're living that close to the line and you get a raise, it's not going 
unfortunately, into the bank, but fortunately, it's being spent in the local economy, which has a great multiplier effect. So um, we've seen, you know, the city's labor force participation rate, rate increase to 69 and that was after, after the minimum wage increase came. So more workers are working. Unemployment is down. We're seeing wages go up, obviously, from this because the pressure is not just on the minimum wage, but people above the minimum wage are seeing right. a little bit of a raise, too. So we found it to be very successful. And, you know, contrary to what people say you're allowed to do, we also reduced our city's business tax at the same time. So, oh, great. you know, there's something that actually helps the businesses when um, employees are making more. And we, I know you're not allowed to do both of those if you're either a Democrat or Republican, but as a mayor, I said, well, both seem to be uh, widely popular, both seem to be needed, and we raised our minimum wages, we lowered our city's business tax. Yeah, that's great. So the mayor of Washington, D.C., and the city council overturned an initiative that had won easily to raise the minimum wage in that city. Uh, To be clear, the mayor and the city council were Democrats. Mm -hmm. Uh, What is that about? How can it be at this point in the evolution of the politics of our country that Democrats in a major city like that would be against this common sense idea? Where do you think that comes from, if you had to guess? Well, you know, and I'm a fan of Muriel Bowser. She's been a, a great and progressive mayor, you know, on so many fronts. And so I don't know all the details of the D.C. Mm-hmm. one. I think part of it had to do with whether or not tips are counted as wages. And, you know, this is a tough one because you talk to a lot of restaurant owners who say, hey, I want to give the back of the house folks a raise. And I'd easily like to pay them 15 bucks an hour for washing the dishes. But my bartender or my waiter easily makes, you know, already 30 bucks an hour with tips or something like that. But if you talk to, and it's usually more women than men, folks who are um, waiters and wait staff, not just at the, you know, uh, fanciest places, but those at the diner where there's not always people, you know, those tips are critically important to get to that minimum wage. So I think that they, it sounded like some of the nightlife people in D.C. convinced them, or restaurant owners, that, you know, they should repeal that, uh, that you can't count tips as part of the wages because they now want to have something standardized, and it really speaks to the fact that it's so chaotic in this country right now. There's so many different laws. We don't have a national leadership model on this. Right. We haven't raised national minimum wage. And, you know, people are really insecure because they don't know where their benefits are going to come from, what they need to pay for. They require the discretion of a customer rather than just the value of their work um, to be able to take home what they need to feed their families and, and have something for health care and even retirement. So, you know, I don't, I don't quite understand it. It's not something I would have done myself, but um, I think there, you can find these cases which people will come from specific industries and say, hey, this is hitting us a little too hard and people are taking actions. Yeah. Um, but it really speaks to just the lack of national leadership on this. Yeah, I think that's true. So, Mayor, I have one more question on the minimum wage. I was looking back at how you ran the campaign down there for the $15 wage in L.A., And I'm looking at a poster that says, we're raising the wage in L.A. to care for our families and our economy. And it strikes me that in many of the early minimum wage fights, we were talking about fairness and doing just a little bit incremental change for the most vulnerable. And you instead were talking about caring for our families and our economy. Can you speak to how you landed on that messaging? I think people forget that that's where we kind of live our lives with the families. When we passed our transportation measure, um, we need a two-thirds vote in California to raise the tax, and um, we were always at about 63 64%. And after two weeks of spending $5 million on ads that talked about jobs and showed tra- uh, trains moving and streets being paved, uh, we'd gone down to 61% until um, my uh, the guy who makes my commercial said, let's just get in a car and drive, no script. Um, you drive, and I'll ask you questions. And um, I think we won by 71%. Because I had a line in there like, here we are stuck in rush hour traffic. Only problem is it's Saturday afternoon. And I think when you humanize these things, like you're just a driver in a car and everybody can relate to that, or your family um, trying to earn a decent wage to put um, food on the table or not decide between food and rent. Um, And when you look at the larger need, which is, hey, we're all part of an economy. You need messaging that includes everybody, that brings that you know wealthy business person in. And we had folks like Eli Broad who 
the founder of two Fortune 500 companies embrace and even say we should accelerate it and go higher and do it faster um, alongside the the people you would expect from organized labor or from you know the religious community. And I think so often we we want to just convince people do this because it's right, and that doesn't mean you know that you're wrong. These are righteous causes; they're the moral uh, right thing to do. But you have to convince people why it's practical. Um, because there's a lot of things that people claim are the morally correct thing. But I think more people across the spectrum will join you if you just say, hey, this works. When people have more money in their pocket, it's going to be good for you as a business owner because they're going right. to come and spend money. Uh, the practical benefits of a moral consideration. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. There you go. I yeah. love that. that. That's my slogan right there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good bumper sticker. <laughs> so. Let's zoom out a little bit and sure. talk about as mayor of what second biggest city in the country? Yes. How do you think about economic policy from the point of view of a Democrat writ large? Let's say you were in charge of the country. Let's say you were president of the country. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, would you, <laughs> what would you do? How would you think about it? Well, I think I would think about it two different ways. One is kind of the philosophical approach and one Mm -hmm. is the policy approach. Yeah. Philosophically, I think we're a country that has always embraced and fought for the underdog. And somehow that brand got taken from us. And Donald Trump convinced everybody that he was fighting for the underdog, that Democrats were the party of kind of elites and special interests. Um, We kind of boxed ourselves into a corner of being the smarty pants party and with a good micro answer to every, you know, three levels down policy question about, you know, the second year of community college for part-time folks and this program that we have (laughs) without ever saying kind of our national vision of who we are, our values. And I I think if, when I boil it down the simplest terms, we should have economic policy that helps the underdog. The underdog has to work hard, has to put in her time. You know, America has always been about incredibly hard workers. But um, a system shouldn't punish the underdog and shouldn't give preference to those who already have over those that don't. Policy-wise, I'll share with you what my economic philosophy as a mayor has been. It's been threefold. Kind of the future and key industries where work and industries are going to grow. Two, investing in infrastructure, looking at government as a co-investor that builds infrastructure that helps the economy prosper. And three, making sure nobody is left behind, that this is an economy where everybody belongs. I like that word belonging, and it applies to all sorts of things, not just economic policy, but I think this kind of tribal debate of whose tribe you're in, or are we part of a big tribe or right. a micro tribe. Um, lots of times people on the Democratic side speak about diversity and tolerance and inclusion. I don't like those words as much because they imply somebody can tolerate somebody else or include you or you're adding diversity. Belonging hits everybody. Mm-hmm. It says you belong here, whether you're you know, that mythical uh, former coal worker in Appalachia, whether you're um, a young woman in high school in South Los Angeles, whether you're living uh, on the border in the Valley in Texas, you all belong. And I think economic policy has to make sure that nobody's left behind, that we all do belong. And then, you know, then you can get into, I think, the specifics of what those economic policies look like. You know, a real pathway to good education and work and training and skills in high school and sharing that between public and private sector together, like we see other countries do very well. Free community college, like we've done here in Los Mm -hmm. Angeles, a good basic minimum wage. Um, you know, a benefit system that allows you to think about your retirements and, and, and in a good way and, and, and health care. Those four pillars for me of kind of economic prosperity are you know, education, good job, decent health care, and a decent place to live. And that last one's tricky because housing markets are very different from place to place. Yes. But the first three are universal and really yeah. can be nationally driven. And uh, I think if we get back to that sense of we're, doing, we're fighting for the underdog, people will, res- will respond to that. Because just like the middle class, everybody thinks they're the underdog in America. There, there are rumors around that you may have national a- aspirations. Do you want to speak to that? Sure. I mean, I have, I have huge national aspirations for a, a country that 
has ideas that come from our local um, communities and kind of take Washington back. My role in that I, is still yet to be determined and something I'm <laughs> chewing on every single day. But uh, I, I've been doing that long before my name landed on any list of potential 2020 candidates. I've been very straightforward. I'm thinking about whether or not to run in 2020. But, you know, I'm, I'm of two minds. Um, uh, I love my job as a mayor, and I think it's such a great post to be able to, with other mayors around the country, remind America that power exists where we live and that it doesn't come from Washington to us, but vice versa. On the other hand, I also fantasize about whether it would be me or another mayor, and I've encouraged others to think about it too, actually going to D.C. We're much less partisan. We work inherently with you know, folks across the aisle. We're kind of nonpartisan, but progressive and focused on results. We don't invent problems and not solve them like we see coming out of D.C. I think we have to be kind and generous and bring people together um, instead of cruel and corrupt like we see out of D.C. So, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, things I think, as long as I can bring something to a conversation, I'll, I'll stay at the table. Uh, whether that results in me, you know, spending the night <laughs> is, is uh, a yeah. big decision for me to make with my family and me. But it's so, an exciting uh, time to be a mayor. Yeah. So I guess I, I hadn't quite thought of it in precisely this way. But maybe America needs a mayor and not a president. You know, I, I, I would be amazing. And let's say tomorrow I decide not to run. I would love to have a mayor run in this country. You know, I even think about what it would be like to have a cabinet and. You could have, uh, you know, your mayor up in Seattle be a, a great attorney general and Mike Bloomberg be a great, you know, um, uh, secretary of treasury. And usually mayors are put into cabinets, but as transportation or HUD, um, if we actually had a cabinet full of mayors from both sides of the aisle who right. uh, have shared values on immigration, shared values on combating climate change, shared values on how you get an economy going, and practical experience. I mean, when I talk about international trade, as a mayor, I think I know as much, if not more, than most senators do because I run the largest port in America, in the in North America and South America, actually, in the port of L.A. and Long Beach, where 40% of the goods come through. So I know those labor issues, I understand, um, you know, the nuances of that. It's a great place to learn. And if states used to be the laboratories of democracy, um, I really think it's now become cities. And there's a lot that Washington could learn. Yeah, it's a, an intriguing metaphor. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for spending this time with us. We, you know, we're really lucky to get to talk to you. And the country is lucky to have you soldiering away on trying to make it a better place. Uh, well, thank you so much to yeah. both, both of you. And thanks, Nick, for you, for being such a clarion voice, too, of, of what our responsibilities are to each other. And I think if Americans come back to, to recognizing that, that politics of uh, multiplication is more powerful than division, um, we're going to be okay. Yep, I agree. So I often forget, Steph, that many of our listeners actually don't follow this stuff as closely as we do. Right. So it's worth it's worth <laughs> reminding them what the what the story is. And if you didn't know, the federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. But the federal minimum for tipped workers is $2.13 per hour, uh, which is quite an astonishing uh, number. If totally crazy. That's, that is that is converging on slavery, yep. isn't it? <laughs> like it's converging almost is zero. Yeah. It's almost zero uh, plus, plus tips. So in Seattle, the idea of raising the minimum wage for all workers to $15 seemed like an, an absolutely insane step. Mm -hmm. And it's worth noting that in Seattle, Washington today, if you work at a restaurant in our city, uh, you earn $15 an hour plus tips. So as opposed to a worker in Alabama working at the same Denny's right. <laughs> who would earn $2.13 plus tips. And here's the really interesting thing about that gap is it's not a 7% difference. It's not a 70% difference. It's a 700% difference in wages. And so for the same work for exactly the same job. So what's interesting about that is that we continue to have Denny's Mm -hmm. in Seattle and in Alabama. All the Denny's have not closed. In fact, the density of restaurants in Seattle, Washington is among the highest in the nation. And what's really interesting to sort of zoom in on is y there's not a starker natural experiment that you can run. I mean, the difference between mm -hmm. 2 and 15 is large. Yeah. If Alabama was at 14 and we were at 15, the effects might be lost in the noise, but the difference between two and 15 is so vast. 
it is a really marvelous test of this proposition that, you know, if you pay workers more, will it crush jobs and will it put all the businesses out of business and so on and so forth? And of course, nothing like that happened. Right. In fact, as you know, the restaurant business in Seattle is insane. It booming. is booming. It is booming. Four restaurants are opening for every one closure right now in our city. And this is for an incredibly simple reason, it should be obvious, but is not to many people, which is that when even restaurants pay restaurant workers enough so that they can eat in restaurants, it turns out to be pretty good for the restaurant business. Right. Go figure. Yeah. Who would have thunk it? And so, you know, it's very exciting to be running this natural experiment with these vast differences so that you can begin to slowly put to bed uh, this idea that raising wages kills jobs, which really is best understood as an intimidation tactic, masquerading as economic theory. It's just a way for rich people to bully poor people into accepting low wages. Right. When I meet people who have visited Seattle in the last you know, five years, they always talk about our food scene. And they should know that when they are celebrating our you know, world-class food scene and here in Seattle, they're also celebrating the $15 minimum right. wage fights that came right yeah. at the same time as that boom. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's been good for everybody. To, to be fair, some of my friends who run restaurants continue to whine about the fact that they have to pay their workers more. But you know, none of them offered to sell me their businesses for a dollar because we had wiped them out. Right. <laughs> right. Just sad. Thought might be able to buy them all. <laughs> So while it's interesting to hear what politicians think about wages, we wanted to really understand public opinion. And for that, we called our friend Richard Kirsch. Richard is the director of Our Story, the hub of American narratives, and he has a better grasp than anyone on American beliefs. Here's his report on recent public opinion polling on raising the minimum wage. One of the most remarkable things about the fight for 15 and the campaign to raise the minimum wage to $15 is at first it did not poll that well. It, was, it seemed like a bold idea, and people had never heard of that. And, and then people have heard in the back of their minds that, oh, minimum wages are going to kill jobs and seem like too much of a reach. So they, you know, $10 is okay, 15 so it didn't poll that well. But as the campaign for it went forward, that's really changed. And two things changed it. One is actually seeing workers were getting paid low wages and couldn't support their families out there fighting. But also another story that was told, a story that really is what's going on, with the minimum wage. And so that story is that um, not that minimum wages kill jobs, but then when people get paid more, they then turn around and spend that money in their local businesses, they spend that money in their communities, and that actually boosts the economy and creates jobs. Now, if you look at the data on this, and this is real minimum wage hikes that have gone on for decades now, and you can see well, when, the, when the government raised the minimum wage nationally or when states raised the minimum wage, did it lead to job loss? And the answer is no. In fact, when minimum wage has been raised, there's been no job loss. Or if you pick one state, say Washington raises the minimum wage and Idaho doesn't, to see in adjoining counties, is there more job loss in Washington? No. It's not like employers are saying we're going to you know, hire people at lower wages in Idaho and not in Pullman. Or, it doesn't happen. So it's just not right. It's just not true. The economics don't work. The facts don't work. And people have gotten that. And by telling the story over and over again that when you raise the minimum wage so that families can care for and support themselves, their spending in their local communities will create jobs in Main Street, will boost local communities. We're now at a point where a polling across the country and including in battleground states are showing between 55 and 60 percent of the public supports raising the minimum wage to $15. And that includes most of the major demographic groups. There's a partisan split, of course, but even 57% of Republican women say they support raising the minimum wage to $15. So this has become a transpartisan issue where almost every demographic group supports it. And it's gone from, oh, that's bold and crazy, to this makes perfect sense. And it makes perfect sense because it's right and also makes perfect sense because it boosts the economy and it creates the kind of middle class, working family driven economy that's the real economy. So I'm incredibly excited to talk to our next guest, uh, the economist Alan Kruger, who's the Bendheim Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton. He's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. But Alan is one of the most respected and experienced economists in the country. He served as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury 
for President Obama and was also the chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Um, but, you know, the best and my most favorite thing about Alan is that he and a colleague were really the first ones to do an empirical analysis of what happens when you raise the minimum wage. Up to that point, basically, people had predicted what would happen if you raise the minimum wage based on neoclassical economic models in spreadsheets. What Alan did was actually looked at the data, actually went out into the world and examined what happened to people and jobs when you raise the wage. And he concluded that nothing happened. And that started a whole new line of empirical economic research to try to answer this incredibly important question. Hey, Alan, Nick. Hey, Nick, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing, you know, I say personally, I'm doing fine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Other than that, it's all good. (laughs) You've been at Princeton 31 years? 31 years. Since 1987. (laughs) Did you go to kindergarten there? (laughs) (laughs) Time flies. (laughs) Well, listen, I want to start off this conversation with a quote from an economist. I want you to name the economist. Uh, And I quote, the inverse relationship between quantity demanded and price is the core proposition in economic science, which embodies the presumption that human choice behavior is sufficiently rational to allow predictions to be made. Just as no physicist would claim that water runs uphill, no self-respecting economist would claim that increases in the minimum wage increase employment. Such a claim, if seriously advanced, becomes equivalent to a denial that there is even a minimal scientific content in economics. Who was that economist? I believe that was James Buchanan. You are correct, sir. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. And where did that quote uh, appear? Do you remember? Uh, my guess is on the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. Yes. And why did he write it? You know, it's a, it's a funny story. <laughs> um The the Wall Street Journal ran a series of criticisms of my work with David Card in the (laughs) mid-90s, like a whole page full. And and that one came in late. That Uh one was printed separate from the rest. Uh So um, it it was, you know, I guess felt by the Wall Street Journal editorial board so important to uh, just pile on to to come up with uh, yet another criticism of us. And yeah. that one was so far over the top. I mean, you, you read the, the, the nicest parts of it. And it just shows, I think, such a different perspective about what science is. Yes. You know, to me, science is to be tested. Yes. And uh, to just assert things from principles without testing just, to me, makes absolutely no sense. Yes. Uh, there are perfectly respectable economic models which have a role where the minimum wage can lead to higher employment, can help companies fill vacancies, for example, or in models where uh, aggregate demand is weak for whatever reason and and wages are too low, minimum wage could lead to more consumer spending and higher uh, uh, economic activity. So it was just so bizarre to me. And and there were parts of it which were uh, uh, much more insulting, actually, than the part that you read. (laughs) Well, you know what? I can't resist just pointing out how angry this is, right? Like, what a remarkable sort of ad hominem attack this is. Well, the, you, you, you skipped over the ad hominem part. The ad hominem part uh, accused David Card of me, and me of being camp-following whores. Literally, that, that's what he wrote. Uh, and it was just stunning to me. Our work wasn't supported by the AFL-CIO. Our work wasn't supported by any interest group. Yet to make the accusation, uh, make the accusation that the only people who could possibly, you know, interpret the evidence the way we interpret it must be people who are carrying the water for somebody or, you know, use much yeah. more provocative language. Uh, I thought it was just totally unprofessional, totally out of place, and a sign of insecurity, I think, in his beliefs. But isn't it more than insecurity? Isn't it the defense of a worldview 
and a set of ideas that enforce a status construct that you really prefer? You know, I guess my interpretation is if your position was so strong, you don't have to be so over the top. Yeah. The evidence would speak for itself. Yes. And he didn't want to go to the evidence. He didn't want to allow evidence to be admissible. Right. And if you take out this block from their edifice, the whole thing crumbles. Right. At the end of the day, that's it. That's it. And I think that's where the insecurity came from, because here was a test, pretty compelling one. And and in fact, when David Card and I presented work years and years ago in the early 90s, Marvin Costers from the American Enterprise Institute was one of our early discussants. And, you know, he was really torn. And you could see he was visibly torn because he thought the methods we were using were pretty compelling. Yes. And to, to his credit, you know, he recognized that this is going to be hard to square with, with his worldview. Yes. And th- there are some people, I think, who, who just have difficulty not fitting the world into a particular structure and take sort of a religious fervor to their approach to economics, which I think is just totally unwarranted. I think that's just not the way the economy operates. That's not the best way to model the economy. Yeah. But there's a strand, and Buchanan represented that. Yeah, it's so interesting. So I just want to remind everybody that Alan Kruger here and his colleagues were among the first uh, 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 investigators of the relationship between raising wages and jobs and uh, you know, to my mind, demonstrated that there wasn't any real impact on the number of jobs around when you raised wages. And I think that early study, which came out when? Uh, 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 the first one? ninety. The, the New Jersey-Pennsylvania comparison, which is the one that's yeah. received, you know, the lion's yeah. share of the attention, that was published in 94. Right. But it's, so, Professor, will you just lay out for our listeners exactly what you looked at in the 94 study and what your conclusions were? Because I think we've sort of skipped over that a little. Yeah. Sure. So in uh, April of 92, the minimum wage in New Jersey rose from four and a quarter to five dollars and five cents an hour, an 80 cent increase, which, you know, on a base of four and a quarter was a pretty large increase. In Pennsylvania, they stayed at the federal minimum wage, which was four and a quarter for the next several years. And David Card and I collected data on fast food restaurants that were located in New Jersey or just across the border in Pennsylvania. And we looked at what happened to employment and wages at fast food restaurants in New Jersey versus Pennsylvania. And the data quite clearly uh, pointed to job growth being at least as strong in New Jersey, and in some cases even stronger than than in Pennsylvania. When we were uh, initially criticized uh, by an industry group, which collected data from you know a handful of, of fast food restaurants, Card and I went to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and we uh, got permission to get the IRS payroll tax data, uh, which the BLS gets from the IRS, and we could look at what the companies were reporting. So we had even more accurate data, and again, it showed a very similar picture. The minimum wage increase in New Jersey didn't lead to job loss. If anything, it led to stronger job growth in New Jersey than Pennsylvania. And since then, there's been, you know, more and more and more, just a a huge pile of empirical evidence that essentially corroborates that early conclusion that you really can't find very much. If you can find any job loss at all, it's it's in the realm of noise. And certainly that's been our experience in Seattle, where all of the good data suggests that nothing happened except things got better for low-wage workers. I think that's what the uh, vast majority of studies have found since yeah. the work that Card and I did. But by the way, Nick, I'll tell you an interesting story, backstory to this. When I started working in this area, my expectation was the conventional wisdom. That, that's what I had been taught. And the work prior to what Card and I had done was primarily based on time series analyses. You look at periods when the federal minimum wage was relatively high or relatively low. A little bit more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. And then you could see whether teenage employment was relatively high or relatively low in those periods, trying to control for some other things. And there was a long tradition of running those kinds of time series models. I was never 
terribly convinced of them, but they tended to find small elasticity of demand. They tended to support the conventional wisdom that higher minimum wage reduced teenage employment. And people would argue about the magnitude, but there was a consensus that that's what it showed. And then a funny thing happened. In the 1980s, the minimum wage did not increase in nominal terms. Ronald Reagan vetoed minimum wage increases, Mm -hmm. and the real value of the minimum wage fell considerably to the lowest level it's been in recent decades. Yet you didn't see the spurt in employment. You didn't see teenage employment grow over that period. Actually, it fell. So if you just estimate those exact same models that have been estimated and extend the time series, add more data, the effect goes away. Now, that's not supposed to happen. Usually when you add more data, if the model is correct, you actually get a more precise, stronger estimate, not a weaker estimate. Right. So that literature had broken down. And when, when I started in this area, I thought, okay, so how do we find a more compelling test? I don't really find the time series all that compelling. Uh, how do we identify a natural experiment? where one area had a minimum wage increase and another one, which otherwise would be very similar, didn't. And that's how David Carr and I focused on the New Jersey-Pennsylvania comparison. And I honestly thought we would be the guys in the white hats rescuing the conventional wisdom when we came in, because anybody you know, who would have been taking this stuff seriously would have said the conventional wisdom broke down. And Yet what we found was more evidence that the conventional wisdom was wrong. So you would think with that background, the profession would have been a little bit more open-minded, that Buchanan uh, would have said, well, maybe I don't have this exactly right. Maybe the world is more complicated than I thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was the background behind behind our work. And the, the other thing I'll just throw in, because you care and most of the rest of the world doesn't, another feature of our our study was we could look within New Jersey because there were sections of New Jersey where the starting wage was already above the new minimum wage. Right. So that formed a control group for the other sections where the minimum wage was pretty low and the minimum wage increase where the starting wage was low. So the minimum wage increase raised wages a lot. And that looked exactly like what we found when we compared across the border from Pennsylvania to New Jersey. So we thought we had, you know, pretty coherent evidence and, and we pushed it pretty far, I think, which is part of the reason why, even though the study is now almost 25 years old, um, the critics still feel compelled to criticize it. So, We're five and a half, six years out from the fight at SeaTac. What do you observe has changed since then? Okay, so we've raised the minimum wage across the country, and there's no credible evidence that anything bad happened other than companies were required to pay workers more. There's certainly no credible evidence that it killed jobs. And so, and yet, Another natural experiment, we've discovered that, you know, the minimum wage, in fact, can rise without uh, harming workers or harming the economy in any material way. I mean, to be clear, it definitely can harm corporate profits. But I think, as we've said many times before, corporate profits are as high as they've ever been. If they go a little bit lower, that won't be bad for the economy generally. I think, Steph, the, the really important question is, why do we have to keep talking about this? Right. So what's your best gut instinct on why we keep having to litigate this question over and over again, why the dogma in all those years hasn't changed? Yeah. And It's such an interesting question. I think it's the question. Because if you reflect on it, what we did on $15 minimum wage is really not different than anything we've done in any of the 22 prior instances where we raised the minimum wage since 1938. We've been running this experiment for Uh, almost 100 years now, 80, 90 years now, in every single case where you go back and look at what happened, jobs grew after raising the minimum wage. And yet the opponents to the minimum wage continue to make the same argument again and again and again that it will kill jobs. And I think that this dynamic exposes economics or the way in which Ordinary people experience economics for what it really is, which is a story that gets told about who deserves what and why. And, you know, the reason that we keep litigating this issue over whether the minimum wage kills jobs 
isn't because it does kill jobs. We keep litigating it because the people who want to keep wages low and profits high have found that that line of argument is the most effective thing they've ever found for keeping wages low and profits high. Again, we've said it many times before. They don't say it because it's true. They say it because it's effective. And what's so important for people to recognize is that that's why this argument never goes away, that this argument will never be settled by facts, Mm -hmm. because this is not a contest over facts. It's a contest over power and status and wealth. And the people who want more status and power and wealth aren't going to wake up one morning and say, oh, we don't want that anymore. Right. Uh, They will continue to want it, and they will continue to try to find ways to get more of it irrespective of the facts. Right. I, I know it's so puzzling to normal people, like people who don't work with this stuff every day, why we keep on, like, it, they assume that because we continue to have this disagreement in public about whether the minimum wage kills jobs or not, that there's actually some factual basis for that disagreement, right. but there's not. It's simply an argument over who should get what and why. And that's the problem. I think one thing I have noticed in the last five years, though, is that the conversation, the public dialogue really has shifted to wages. I mean, Republicans aren't just talking about jobs. They're talking about wages. Yes. They're just not talking about the minimum wage, lifting the minimum wage as an answer to how we lift wages. They talk about keeping immigrants out. Yeah. They talk about lowering taxes for rich people yeah. to lift wages, yeah. but they're not ready to cede that genuinely lifting the minimum wage yes. so that people have cash in their yeah. pockets directly would yeah. be a way to actually for accomplish sure. that. And if you're trying to defend the interests of owners of capital, which is largely what the right does today, what to be fair, lots of people in the Democratic Party, too, who are as committed to trickle-down economics as any card-carrying Republican, that's where you have to go, that none of these folks want to just acknowledge that the way to raise wages is to raise wages. Right. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. That there's a very simple answer to these questions and that you can just simply impose reasonable standards on companies to pay their workers enough to get by without food stamps. This is a very easy and simple way to solve the problem. Technically, uh, it just involves trade-offs that lots and lots of people don't want to make. Like angering rich donors. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, <laughs> you're just going to anger all your rich donors. So. so where do you think we go from here? You know, we started with the fight for 15, but should we be moving as our economy continues to grow towards 20, towards 30? What's the new ask? Yeah. And in future episodes, we're going to talk about this new idea we have, which is called progressive labor standards. And progressive labor standards is an incredibly simple idea that addresses a couple of important economic issues and a political one, which is simple ideas to impose the highest standards on the largest companies. The biggest companies in the country certainly can afford to pay much higher wages. And corporate concentration is a a separate but connected problem to rising inequality. And by holding the biggest companies to the highest standard, we also hope to create more space for smaller companies and startups to compete. And if you hold the biggest companies to the highest standard, there's no reason why those companies can't be held to a standard, for instance, of $30 an hour. While it might be challenging for the smallest companies to go to 30, it is absolutely not a challenge for Walmart to go to 30, although, of course, the shareholders and the executives will squeak and squawk and complain and shout a lot of stuff about socialism. So even though we've made progress, there's more work to do, new ideas on the horizon. It's exciting. Yep. Lots to do. Lots of stuff to push for if we're going to make an economy that works for everybody. I'm super excited for the next episode of Pitchfork Economics. In that episode, we will examine one of the anchor claims of neoliberalism is the purpose of the corporation to enrich shareholders. Fork Economics is produced by Civic Ventures. The magic happens in Seattle in partnership with Large Media, that's L-A-R-J Media, and the Young Turks Network. Find us on Twitter and Facebook at Civic Action and follow our writing on Medium at Civic Skunkworks. And you should also follow Nick Hanauer on Twitter at Nick Hanauer. 
As always, a big thank you to our guests and thank you to our team at Civic Ventures. Nick Hanauer, Zach Silk, Jasmine Weaver, Jessen Farrell, Stephanie Irvin, David Goldstein, Paul Constant, Nick Casella, and Annie Fadley. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.